we're about to go on our first ever virgin voyage and I'm pumped up. There are lots of reasons to hop on board this luxurious vessel. Most people are here to visit multiple exotic destinations where they can sunbathe on white sand beaches next to clear blue water or choose to do more adventurous excursions like jet skiing. Some people are here to check out several of the ship's top restaurants and try the exquisite cuisine. They're here to see exhilarating one-of-a-kind shows and party like there's no tomorrow. And wake up in spacious rock star suites before doing it all again. Yeah, some people are here for those things, but not everybody. This guy is named Dwayne. He's come all the way from Oregon for the sole purpose of retrieving some coveted Bradley dollars. He's going to get the opportunity so will plenty of others as we're hosting our first ever 2-5 meetup game in a poker room on a boat. There's no three hour tour, right from the jump, people have made it clear, they're not messing around. Maserati, you coming for me? Yes sir. <laughs> Back to Bradley. <laughs> While in the presence of a Maserati, it's no surprise that we get off to a fast start. We've got pocket queens under the gun the very first hand, a raise to 15. Maserati calls from under the gun plus one. As soon as he walked into the poker room today, he came right over and told me that he was going to stack me. I'm not the only person that he has to worry about in this hand. The hijack three bets is 60. Okay, this is how cruise ship poker is going to be, huh? We're going nowhere, we call for 45 more. Maserati isn't going anywhere either. He calls, it's a three-way, three-bet pot, and we're out of position. The flop comes king, king, four, rainbow. I actually prefer to see two kings out there rather than just one because it makes it less likely that we're up against a hand like ace king or pocket kings since the number of possible combinations of those holdings are reduced. I check, under the gun plus one checks, the preflop aggressor continues with this fictional story that he's got something good, he bets 55. It's too soon to give up for that low of a price, I call hoping that we don't see too much aggression on future streets, or on this street, we don't get what we hoped for, Maserati puts in the check raise to 140. Even if he had trip kings or better, I don't think that he'd necessarily check raise the flop with no draws out there. This raise is extremely suspect. What I appreciate about it is that it squeezes out the hijack. He's actually the player that I thought was most likely to have a strong hand. He folds. The way that we've played this, pocket queens feels a little underrepped, and given what Maserati's been saying before the session even started, the guy's check raise can't be trusted. We're calling. Yeah, that's what I want. You getting it. <laughs> the table is fully aware of the dynamic at play. When you know people have you in their sights, you've got to make adjustments. Often that means calling lighter, particularly when betting patterns don't tell a convincing story. We're heads up in position. The turn is the deuce of spades. There are two spades out there now. I check. We get a better indication as to the strength of our opponent's hand as Maserati pumps the brakes with a check back. Perhaps he has a four or a low to medium pocket pair. The river is another four, as long as our opponent didn't make fours full, we should have the best hand. I check, immediately after, under the gun plus one checks back, good news for us as we turn over the winner. Maserati mucks face down. <laughs> what happened? What happened? <laughs> Maserati hits a speed bump, we're up a couple hundred the very first hand of the session. This is a good game. Next we pick up pocket jiggities on the button while the under the gun straddles on. The cutoff limps in for 10. We've got no choice but to punish him. I raise to 50. Maserati sees an opportunity to get his money back and perhaps more. He calls our raise from the small blind. The big blind calls. The cutoff doesn't want to miss out on the party. He calls. We're going four ways to the flop in position. It comes 10-7-4 with two clubs. We've got an overpair on a fairly connected board with multiple opponents. The small blind checks. Typically, what would happen is that it checked to the preflop aggressor, but that's not the case here. The big blind bets 75. The situation gets more interesting as the cutoff calls. This is a tricky scenario to navigate. Two players have indicated with their actions that they at least have a piece. Our hand is way too good to ever fold, but it has very little chance of improving. Not only are cards like clubs and tens bad for us, any card between a three and a jack that doesn't pair the board will allow a straight to be possible. In addition, any ace, king, or queen will downgrade the strength of our pair as well. Since our hand is currently strong, and there are virtually no cards that we'll be happy to see on future streets, it's imperative that we get as much money in now as we can, while we're probably ahead. It's doubtful that someone has two pair or better here, but we could potentially be up against a set or big combo draw, especially since we don't have the jack of clubs in our hand. I raised a 300 to separate the contenders from the pretenders. The small blind folds, the actions on the big blind who bet 75 into three other players, including us as the preflop raiser. As I mentioned previously, the main made hands that I'm concerned about being up against are just sets, and a lot of the time, I'd anticipate a player in the big blind's position to check raise a hand like that, rather than bet it at the first opportunity. 
because she didn't check raise, I actually think it's less likely that she has a monster hand and more probable that she has one pair and bet to see where she's at. Maybe she has a draw. The big blind folds. We're down to just one remaining opponent. The cutoff almost definitely doesn't have a speed, otherwise he would have raised himself rather than allow an opportunity for the big blind to see additional cards without putting extra money in, while also allowing us and the small blind a chance to stay in with marginal holdings and great pot odds with several draws out there. The cutoff takes time to consider his options, then eventually folds. When I have this hand, it's mandatory that I show it. Good fold, good fold, good fold. Check it is. Check it is. Check it is. It's tough to beat the atmosphere of a poker room on a ship. Everyone's in a great mood because we're all on vacation, we've left our troubles behind us on the mainland, and we're just here to have a fun time. Plus, the action is exceptionally good, as evidenced by this three-way all-in in the double board bomb pot. Maserati, how are we feeling about this one? Oh, we're about 20-80. Okay. Having about a 20% chance of winning when you're all-in may seem like a small percentage, but I get the sense that 20% is better than usual for Maserati. He gives us a peek at his cards. He's got 7-3 of diamonds, good for a low flush draw on both boards, and a pair of threes to go with it on the bottom board. In a three-way all-in, he's right to be estimating a small percentage of victory since his diamond draw may not even be good. Plus, he could already be drawing dead on the top board where a full house is possible. He's got an awesome attitude and isn't sweating it too much. Here's my rebound. <laughs> yeah. No more action. We're running this out. This is a tense moment with a big pot at stake. The situation gets worse for Maserati as the 8 of spades comes on the top board, but it's much better for him on the bottom board with the 7 of hearts showing up, giving him 2 pair. He's got a legitimate shot at winning at least half the pot. The top river is another 8, Maserati's playing the board there, then the bottom river is another queen counterfeiting his 2 pair and essentially leaving him with a pair of 7s. After breaking the flush draw on both boards, he's in very big trouble. We see his first opponent has king 6 offsuit for a full house on the top board, but has complete air on the bottom board. The second opponent shows ace king, has the same full house up top, but also nothing on the bottom board. Maserati somehow gets it in amazing given exactly what his opponents had. He can put those rebuy hundreds away as he's the only player of the three to make a profit given the fact that he's the sole winner of the bottom board and he'll receive half the pot, whereas the other two opponents chop the top board and will receive only 25% of the pot each. Next we've got king jack offsuit on the button and a straddle pot, I raised it 30. The small blind calls, the under the gun straddler calls, we're going three ways to the flop in position, it comes jack 10 six all spades, we've got top pair and the king high flush draw to go along with it. Checks to me, note that this is really the exact opposite situation as when we had pocket jacks on the 10 high board, there are tons of cards that can help us improve on the turn river here, including any spade, jack or king. Because of that, I'm not worried about giving my opponents a free card. Maserati's in the small blind, I'd like to give him a chance to bluff at it, I put in a sneaky check back to feign weakness. The turn is the three of clubs, it's a blank, there's no bite from Maserati, he checks. Under the gun puts in a nice bet of 60 though. Maybe he flopped a flush, maybe he's taking a stab at it as a bluff to avoid putting in extra money if we're beat and to keep the opponent's bluffs in, I call the 60 rather than raise. The small blind folds, it's down to heads up, the river is the king of diamonds giving us two pair, it's a good card for us, still, I'm not 100% sure we've got the best hand even as the opponent checks could be up against a set or a small flush or even the ace high flush and the opponent could reasonably check for pot control or to give us a chance to bluff at it if he puts us on a flush draw that didn't get there on the river. Our hand is too good to check back, I bet 150 in case the under the gun player has a worse two pair, something like king queen, maybe even a pair of jacks that he wants to bluff catch us with. Under the gun thinks better at calling, he folds what he'd later say is a pair of jacks. Our tricky check on the flop at least partially backfired, the river seemed good but also made it tougher for us to get paid by second pair. Still, it's a decent outcome for us. With this win, we're up 600. It's time for another $20 double board bomb pot. We're in the small blind with the king eight offsuit. We go eight ways to the flop. We've got top pair and a backdoor flush draw on the first one. The second one, we've got top pair as well, but there are three hearts, so it's not too exciting. The action checks to Margie in the hijack. She bets 100. Folding right now seems both appealing and somewhat premature at the same time. Sure, we have top pair on both boards, but there are plenty of hands that we're not in good shape against, like ace-8 of hearts, for example, or 6-5 of hearts. I'm on the fence. There are several players behind me left to act as well. I can't get myself to fold. I'll call one time to see what develops. It ends up being heads up. The top turn is the ace of clubs, so we pick up the flush draw there. The bottom turn is the seven of diamonds, making it so three of the sevens are accounted for. Kings and sevens with a jack kicker is a decent hand there. Altogether, I feel better about our situation now than I did on the flop. I check, Margie checks back indicating that she's worried about something. 
I'd be more suspicious that she could be doing this as a trap if we didn't have the king of clubs in our hand, blocking her from having the nuts on at least one board. The first river is the nine of spades. We brick our draw. Third pair isn't looking great there either. The second river is the six of hearts, putting four to the flush on board. I'm not confident at all that we can win this at showdown. But we have to be good on both boards to win more than half the pot. We've got some interesting blockers to full houses, two pair hands, and the club flush. Plus, the opponent showed weakness after getting called on the flop. We may be able to bully the hijack off plenty of hands that are beating us on one or both boards. I announce a bet of 325. I just have king and a eight. Pair kings And I have two pair on the top. Eights and fours on top. And a flush. You win? She wins? Nice hand, nice hand. Nice hand. What did I say? I didn't even realize I had a flush. Yeah. Thank you. Just to make it hurt extra bad. <laughs> the session was going so smoothly, then Margie comes in like a rogue wave with her 8-4 offsuit to wreck my world with a flop 2 pair and a rivered flush that she didn't know she had. The bad news is that I lose several hundred. The good news is, despite that, we're still up a little on the day. In this one, we've got 9-8 suited and the under-the-gun straddle. Maserati double straddled to 20. We've gotten several double and triple straddles on so far. The cutoff calls. It's only 10 more for us. We call. Maserati isn't letting anyone see a flop or a discount. He raises to 100. That's too much for the cutoff. She folds. Maserati's been giving a lot of action, and I know he's after me. We've got a playable hand. I'll give him an opportunity to get involved with us in a big pot. I call for 80 more. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes king, king, five with two clubs got a flush draw. I like it. I check. Maserati immediately checks back, which terrifies me. He's the preflop aggressor, so I'd anticipate him c-betting all types of hands on a paired board, especially after I limp called the raise. It's a Broadway card that's paired rather than some lower medium denomination, which could hit my range. I'd expect him to at least consider betting if he has complete air or medium strength hand. With a rapid fire check, I get the sense that he's feigning weakness to induce a bluff from me. The turn is the 10 of clubs, giving us a flush. Now I'm hoping that he flop trips so we can take him to value town. I go with a fairly large sizing of 150. There's no quick decision from the opponent this time. It doesn't appear that he's considering folding either. It looks a lot like he's deliberating between calling and raising. Almost a full minute goes by before the opponent finally calls. I'm not 100% sure if we're best. I try to get a better feel from Maserati's hand by seeing how he reacts when I say, Jesus, did you flop quads? <laughs> The river is an awful card. If our opponent flop trips are better, we're beat. There's still some chance that we're up against a hand like ace-queen with the club, or perhaps aces with the ace of clubs, but I don't really know. I check. Maserati bets 300. I don't beat anything that he'd play this way and bet for value. I basically just have a bluff catcher, unless maybe he has pocket aces. It's not that large of a bet. It seems like he wants to get called. What's replaying in my head is the fact that he check-raised bluffed in the first hand of the day, and he said multiple times that he's coming after me. I'm also wondering if me asking if he flopped quads earlier could have somehow induced a bluff if he in fact does have ace-queen offsuit. I'm getting too good of a price against an opponent whose bets I can't trust. Even though something doesn't feel right, I'm in a tough spot and I'm truly on the fence. God damn, I just feel like you're so strong here with my call. Curiosity gets the best of me. Our call loses us an extra 300. The opponent has ace-king offsuit. His immediate check back on the flop was indeed a ploy, but it backfires, so we drill a flush on the turn. Then it unbackfires as he makes a boat on a boat and gets paid. Maserati gets back all the money that he lost to me earlier and some extra Bradley dollars on top. I go from winning several hundred to suddenly being stuck several hundred. I add on for 500 more, head to the next table. We pick up pocket queens in the small blind. Under the gun plus one raises to 15. Player in middle position, three bets is 60. The cutoff cold calls is 60. It's incredible how much action there is today. There are only two hands better than mine that are possible. The cutoff certainly doesn't have us beat or he would have four bet. It's still possible that under the gun plus one or the three better have us smoked, but not all that likely. I don't want to play a big multi-way pot out of position, and I'm not folding. I put in the cold four bet to 250 to end the hand right now or narrow down the field. I really don't want to see a five bet jam. We'll probably have to fold if it comes. Luckily, the initial preflop raiser and three better both fold. The cutoff still has cards. He's going to hold on to what he's got. It doesn't make a difference if he makes a hand or not. He calls. We're heads up out of position with a lot of money in the middle. The flop comes 3-3 three, three deuce with two hearts. We almost for sure still have the best hand. We're about halfway there. I down bet to 150 in order to keep in hands that are drawing nearly dead, like low to medium pocket pairs or even jacks. The cutoff calls. 
not too concerned about the opponent having a flush draw given that we have the queen of hearts and this is a four bet pot. The only flush draw I really see the opponent having is maybe ace king of hearts. The turn is the eight of diamonds. I hope the opponent doesn't have a boat. We've only got 445 total in our stack. I could reasonably jam, but I don't want to chase off a hand like sevens. I want to rope that type of hand in with a smaller bet. We'll give it a shot. I bet 200, so if he calls here, he'll almost have to call a river jam for 250 if he has a pair of any sort. My bet also puts a hand like ace king off suit with one heart in a weird position. The cutoff calls once more. I still think the most likely hands that he'll have are smaller pocket pairs and queens. The river is the ten of spades. It's now very possible that the opponent either turned or river to full house. With only 245 behind, we've just got to rip it in, somewhat living on a prayer. All in. As long as we win this pot, we're unstuck for the day. We don't get snap called, meaning we almost for sure have the best hand. The opponent is getting an absurd price to call in order to get to showdown. It seems like he's down on his luck, probably at the bottom of his range. Ultimately, he folds. We get the victory for the biggest pot that we've won up to this point today. We're unstuck and are currently profiting tens of dollars as the dealer takes my hand. Here we're dealt ace-queen offsuit under the gun plus one. Under the gun limps in. We can't have that. I raise to 20. A player in middle position calls, the cutoff calls, the big blind calls, and the under the gun limper calls. We're going roughly 17 ways to the flop. It's a little worrisome. The dealer puts out ace-10-3 with two clubs. We've got top pair with some backdoor draws to the nuts. I like it. Checks to us. We can't let anyone see a free turn, especially when there are so many opponents. I bet 50 to weed out the riffraff. The player in middle position folds. The cutoff calls. The big blind and under the gun fold. It's heads up. The turn is the deuce of clubs. It's interesting because flush draws get there. We have the ace of clubs though, so we actually pick up a draw ourselves. And we have a blocker to the nuts, so we can kind of bet with impunity to get value out of worst aces. And charge a hand like king queen offsuit with a club. I make it 150. The cutoff isn't a quitter. He calls, it's a bit concerning. If we don't improve, I may go into check call mode on the river. The dealer puts out the queen of hearts, giving us top two pair. King Jack also gets there, though that's not a super likely hand we'd be up against. I bet 325. If we didn't have the ace of clubs in our hand, this would have played much differently on the turn the river. We get snap called, the opponent has king queen of clubs and turned the second nuts, but played it cautiously. It's an unfortunate run out for us as we improved on every street. We're at a low point for the day as our session ends. Bit of a shorter session today, but had a great time. Couldn't beat anybody, lost uh, $610, but uh, still had a blast. And looking forward to playing some more poker on this cruise. This is my first session, actually my first ever poker session in a casino setting was uh, on a cruise ship when I was 17. So uh, I haven't played poker on a cruise since, and it's pretty awesome to be back, but uh, couldn't get a win, so hopefully I'll be able to get some of that money back later on the cruise. I try my best, but I'm not able to recover the money. I play a few more sessions, including the $520 main event that gets 64 entries. Early on, we get a big double up with pocket aces after getting it in pre-flop against ace-queen suited. It's a big pot, but we aren't able to get anything going from there. Ultimately, we don't make the money as we get short and get it in with top pair against a better top pair on the flop. Still, it's such a great time, great energy here. I'm not the only one that feels that way about the trip either. Uh, it's been great. Um, this is the first cruise I've ever been on, so I hear that we're kind of spoiled with the way that they lay it out. Yeah. Um, we've had dinner at different restaurants every night. It's been fantastic food, so uh, cool. yeah, we're, we're excited. My girlfriend and I are excited about coming on another one soon. Where are you from? Oregon. Oregon? Oregon coast, yeah. Nice. How did and you just decided to take the cruise? or? So I watched your vlog, and uh, I heard about it, and I was just like, hey, my birthday was last Sunday, so I had to do it for my birthday and play some poker. Though the poker for me didn't go quite as I hoped, I had a blast making connections with all the viewers on the ship and even some of the staff. Dealer named Spanky saw this giraffe at one of the ports, then purchased it, gave it to me as a gift. Spanky's been a longtime viewer. In episode one, six years ago now, I mentioned that some people call me the giraffe around town in Vegas. There's a cool piece that's now visible on the back shelf in my office. Beyond poker, the service and the entire experience on the Virgin ship is incredible. They treated the whole WPT team so well. We even got a tour of the bridge. I'll certainly never forget that. Plus, I got to hang out with a whole bunch of tiny monkeys at the Dominican Republic port. 
I think this is about the happiest that I've ever been on the vlog. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd really appreciate it. If you hit the like and subscribe buttons if you haven't yet. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comments section. I'm happy to get back to you. Big thanks goes out to Virgin and everybody who uh, came on this trip. It was awesome to get to know the viewers a little bit more than we would in a normal meetup game setting since we actually spent, you know, a um, five night vacation with these people and saw them all over the ship. So that was awesome. And then um, the WPT World Championship Series at the win is going on right now. And there's just been uh, an incredible reception from poker players, which is huge because sometimes, you know, we can be a bit of a cynical bunch. So the fact that everything is running smoothly and um, everyone's having a good experience is amazing. And, and it's not just for uh, recreational players, but like top level pros are saying that this is, you know, one of the best series ever, basically. So uh, if you're able to make it out for the main event, there are three day ones, uh, probably, probably going on right now. Um, and then, you know, if you're not able to make it out this series, be sure to keep it on your radar. Just being at the win, one of the, really the premier property for poker in Las Vegas is pretty amazing. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables and I'll see you next time.